uh, urgently. So we will be recording the meeting. This is just in recognition of the fact that, that we did um, not leave much time. And so there were many leaders who wanted to attend, but were not able to. We will stop the recording um, at the end when we have time for questions. So you can feel free to ask questions um, as you wish without worrying about it being recorded. We'll just be recording our portion um, and then we'll share the recording with others who were not able to be here today. Um, we'll also be sending an email out officially launching the, the advocacy framework. So all the materials will be included in that email. Um, and the framework itself will be available uh, online on our website. Um, we have a French interpreter with us today. Her name is Adeline. Adeline, do you want to just maybe do a wave or unmute and say hello? <laughs> um, so what we're going to do is we're going to do the English portion first. I think there are some people who've identified that they um, want to hear the presentation in French. So once we've done that, we'll then move over and do it in French. And you can stay if you want to, otherwise you can jump off the call. Um, and Adeline will, will do the interpretation for us. Um, before we begin though, I wanna recognize my team as well. We have a, we have a very small but mighty team at uh, Parents of Black Children and they've all worked incredibly hard um, over the last week to pull all the elements, all the pieces that you see today on our website um, and that you'll see over the week. Um, they've been working really diligently to pull that together. So I want to just say thank you to them, Jasana, Deanna, Shannon, um, uh, Charlene, and Xavier as well. So um, Deanne, if you can share the screen and we'll get started, we're going to start with the land acknowledgement. Okay. So where we, where we stand may be a little bit different depending what part of the province you're in. Um, but for us, we are acknowledging that the land on which we are all meeting um, is in the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. We acknowledge all treaty peoples, including those who came here as settlers, we also acknowledge those of us who were brought here forcibly as a result of transatlantic enslavement. We honor and pay tribute to the ancestors of African origin and descent. We occupy stolen land at the displacement of indigenous peoples. We acknowledge the ancestors of this land as Ontario's many systems continue to administer and exercise colonial power in indigenous and racialized communities. It is important to reflect about what has happened what is happening and what changes can be made going forward to further reconciliation. And I think as we, you know, we're here to talk about advocacy and I think it's, this is a great way to kind of anchor the discussion and reflecting on the past, what's happening now and, and what we can do to change the future. So if we move to the next slide, a really brief, um, really brief introduction about us. So in terms of the agenda, we'll, we'll go through this step by step, but essentially we're here, to, the purpose of this meeting is to roll out our advocacy framework. Um, you know, most of the school boards across this province have been receptive to, add to the advocacy support. Um, we've seen, you know, great outcomes in cases where we are supporting families, um, but we're also getting pushback. And that's really what we're here to address, what we're here to talk about and what the advocacy framework was designed to, um, was designed to kind of tackle. Um, and so we're gonna go through that framework piece by piece and then give you the opportunity to ask questions. So very briefly about the organization, for those of you who do not know, um, we, we are, you know, we're an advocacy organization. We work across Canada. We have a chapter in the US and Maryland. Um, but our primary operations are here in Ontario. And our goal, our vision is always about creating an equitable and peaceful educational experience for our children. Um, we, we, we work our, around three pillars, so we don't do a lot of programs. Um, our focus is transformational change. Um, we're looking at, you know, what are the areas that we can um, 
advocate for um, that will create the systemic change that we want to see for our kids so that we're not doing this in 40 years. That's always what we're thinking about. How do we make sure that we're not here again? How do we make sure that things change so that the next generation that, that's coming up, it looks different for them? Um, we also provide, if you can go to the next slide, Dan, we also provide um, systems navigation support, which is the advocacy support, and then a lot of pa patient uh, parent education and resources. So next slide, please. So today we're here to talk about advocacy. Um, like I said, for the most part, most boards have been receptive to the advocacy that, that we are delivering to families. Um, we currently have just parents of black children um, about 360 cases from, from last year, so over the last year and a half. Um, and we're inundated with families who are requiring support. Most families, when they reach out to us, we're not the first point of call. 60% of the families that come to us have tried to, to, to have some kind of resolution in their school um, or within their school board before reaching out to us. So they're coming to us as a last resort. They're coming to us because they have nowhere else to turn. Um, we all, I hope on this call, know what we're seeing, uh, the differential experience that black children are having in the education system, whether it's around teacher bias over surveillance of black children. So policing them, pulling you know, black boys in particular out of class and searching them or searching their, their bags, over disciplining of black students, lack of representation in, in the curriculum and the, the high need of disaggregated race-based data so we know how our children are doing. So all of these are the issues. These are all reasons why parents come to us for support. Um, and if we move to the next slide. Um, knowing all of those reasons, Knowing all of knowing the the experience that Black children are having, um, because it because the system is not neutral, because the experience is not the same as everyone else's, the need for advocacy becomes um, critical. It is it, it becomes so important, and it is a historic part of black of the Black community. It is not just um, you know there have been so many organizations, so many community. Um, iterations of community groups over the years, including parents of black, black children, you know, that existed, that the name of this organization ex actually existed 20, 30 years ago, doing the same kind of work. And here we are um, standing on their shoulders, you know, doing advocacy um, again for families. And so this is, a, it's historic, it's anchored in um, our communities as, as black people. It's what drives significant change in the education system. So, you know, the fact that schools are open to community to, you know, I don't know, have soccer games or play basketball or whatever it is, that comes from advocacy, that comes from Black communities um, demanding access, right, to schools. Um, the end of streaming for children, um, Caribbean and African children in the, in the 70s and 80s who were being streamed into into English as a second language, even though they, they spoke English or came from English speaking countries, all of that comes from advocacy. Um, and we stand on the shoulders of, of those who came before us. Parents of Black children, we are only one of many advocacy organizations or many organizations providing advocacy services across this province. So we, we um, have a program called Student and Family Advocate Program. We lead the community of practice and there are 16 other organizations um, that also have the Student and Family Advocate Programs. Many of them have multiple advocates, which means there are at least 20, 20 plus um, uh, individuals across this province whose job it is, is to go into school boards to, and schools to support Black families as they're navigating the education system and adjacent systems. So it's really important um, knowing that, that our community groups and school boards can work together. So next slide. So the other piece before we get to the framework that we wanted to really anchor this conversation in is the fact that in many ways, this type of advocacy and systems navigation might be new to the education system, but it is not new to other systems within this province. So 
the justice system is a good example of, of a system that has worked with advocates for, for quite a long time, but the healthcare system as well is a great example of where there are system navigators, um, advocates who um, have been embedded in the healthcare system. If I think about Cancer Care Ontario, which is now Ontario Health, but the cancer system, they have Indigenous um, system navigators. They have diagnostic assessment program system navigators. Um, they have, you know, like all sorts of navigators that work across the system and their job, their sole job is really to be that person that stands side by side um, uh, uh, as a, uh, an individual as they're navigating the system. So, and, and in 2018, I was part of an initiative where, um, called One Vision, One Voice. It was, it's a community-based initiative anchored within Ontario Association of Children's Aid Societies. And there, you know, we launched a pilot project that anchored system navigators within the child welfare system. So these are not, the advocacy and the idea of systems navigation is, it, it's relatively new to education, but it is not new to systems across the province. And it's very important um, to remember that and to think about that as you're engaging with, with, with advocates. Um, advocacy we've written here, and I think, again, one of, one of the key messages I'd like to leave you with is that advocacy is both a best practice and a promising practice. So it is a best practice because we have seen the way it works in other systems. There is data that tells you how beneficial it is. Um, and it's a promising practice because it might it's relatively new, um, the, way, the way in which it's being uh, done within the education system. And there's opportunities there for, for growth um, and to see you know, what the impacts are. So like I said, we have student and family advocates that work across the province. And really what this advocacy framework is about is it's, it's about our expectations. It's about, you know, how we collaborate um, and how we resolve um, anti issues of anti-Black racism, issues of concern for Black, for Black children. Next slide, please. Thank you. So, if we get to the crux of the of the advocacy framework, um, we've tried to anchor it. We start with our approach, um, and then we kind of go on from there to our expectations. So our approach is is really grounded in four main pillars. It's about urgency, uh, consent, transparency, and accountability. Those are the four things that any case that comes to us, those are the four things, the four ways in which we respond. Urgency, because we know um, these are children and we know the impacts that um, the, the anti-Black racism, the racial violence, the trauma that they're dealing with or that they faced in school um, is urgent. It is a matter of urgency and we respond as such. We always say that we have a 911 response and we need to have that response to, to racial violence. If we think about it, racism is the only form of trauma that we expect children to live with. If they are being sexually abused, if they are being physically abused, we act, we are quick. But with racism, you know, it's kind of often hands up and nobody knows what to do. And we have to talk to this person. There's this policy. What we're saying is we need to cut that. We need to act with urgency because there are real impacts and real implications for children and their parents and their parents. Um, consent. So we have a full intake process, as do the other advocacy organizations that work across this province or the other organizations that are delivering advocacy. All of us have, a, a, have a, an intake process. And part of that intake process is around consent. So with the Parents of Black Children's intake process, our cons we have consents that parents sign that allow um, us to, to speak on their behalf, to provide information about their case to third party supports like mental health therapists or a social worker um, or the school. Um, and so it's, we want to make sure that that is also, it's recognized and you understand as well that that is part of our process. We will never work with a family unless they come through our intake process. And that means they've already filled out those consents, which are, are re recorded and, and binding. Um, transparency. Our team is diligent in ensuring that everyone is notified. So if there is a case at your school, 
the email is sent to uh, the administrator, but it's also sent to the superintendent and for those egregious cases to the director of education. And our goal, the purpose in doing that is because we don't want anybody to say, I didn't know. I didn't know this was happening at one of my schools. I didn't know this was happening. Um, it, we believe in transparency and we never want to do one-on-one -on -one meet, one -on -one meetings. We want meetings where everyone is there. Um, and the other piece around that transparency is circumventing. So we don't expect, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but the circumventing of, of advocates or those sidelining of advocates to say to a parent, I'll talk to you directly. Let's not include the advocates. That's not a transparent process and that's not what we expect. And then accountability. So we expect that when there is harm, when our children are, are, are facing uh, racial violence, um, that there is accountability um, and that those that are responsible are, are held to task for that. And we'll explain what, what we mean by accountability in the next slide. Can we go to the next slide, Deanne? Thank you. So for us, we've tried to boil down accountability into, into you know, bite-sized information. So the four R's, when you think about accountability, what we're asking you to do is think about these four, these four areas, reporting, removing, resolving, rebuilding, reporting. Charlene is on the call, so she can correct me. I think it was 2020 where the Ontario College of Teachers Act was, was, was um, amended to include discrimination as a professional malpractice. It wasn't before. <laughs> so what we're asking is in, in instances where, there had, where there's been investigation um, and a, an educator, anyone has been found um, to be guilty, we want you to report that to the Ontario College of Teachers. We want you to report, we want you to report it to the body, the reporting bodies as required. Um, there has to be uh, a record, there has to be um, a trail, and it shouldn't be up to the parent to have to, or us as an advocacy group, to have to fight for justice for a child and then also fight to make sure that the, the back end pieces, the reporting pieces are followed through on. Our expectation is that school boards will do that. Um, we cannot live or continue to live in this, in this world where we protect those that are doing harm. We can't do that. There has to be accountability. Um, remove. So when there are issues or instances where black children are experiencing emotional harm, physical harm, and it's, let's say, an educator, whoever it is, a student, we're asking for that person to be removed. Instead of simply moving the educator, the administrator to another school, another position, um, we want them to be removed from the situation. Resolve. So we're looking for resolution. We're asking boards and um, uh, school board leaders to come to meetings with solutions. So. Um, don't come asking the parent, like, what do you want me to do? Come with solutions. How can you, what, what impactful resolution can you offer in this situation? So if a child is at home, how, what is the resolution to getting them back at school? What supports can you provide um, in order to make sure that they are, they are made whole, um, right? As, 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 the, as the issue is resolved. And then rebuilding all of these cases we need to look at and examine what led to this how did we get here what are the policies that maybe weren't working how do we change those how are we going to dismantle them how do we so that this doesn't happen again we don't want to continue to create and replicate and use policies that are creating harm over and over again we want to change them so we're asking you to do that work in rebuilding um, as well okay next slide Okay, so what do we expect from school boards? A timely response. So the urgency is, is important. Oftentimes, it almost feels in some cases that there's a, um, it's like an intentional dragging of the feet 
if there's a response and it doesn't that doesn't recognize that's not a child centered approach it doesn't recognize what's happening to the child in that moment um and so for us like i said we act with urgency and we expect that back um the, the swiftness is what really what we are looking to see uh, active engagement in parent in meetings with parents along with their advocates making space to ensure that parents can come to meetings together um, with the advocate um, not isolating or pushing that advocate out um, being prepared to have challenging conversations so come prepared for the meeting to be difficult come prepared to, to be uncomfortable come prepared for the discomfort and ready to identify solutions and, and resolutions it's not easy you know I said that it's advocacy is not it's not comfortable for anybody it's not comfortable for for the advocate it's not comfortable for the people on the other side of the table the school the school board leaders administrators and educators and it is not comfortable for parents right there's they're not sleeping there's they're riddled with anxiety and our advocates are right there with them and so it's not comfortable for anyone but we have to push past that in order to um identify the resolutions. Um, the other piece that we ask for is inclusion of the school board's human rights and equity uh, team, if you have one, um, the advisor, if you have one, um, so that there's somebody there with an equity lens, someone there who should have um, an equity lens and an understanding of anti-Black racism. Okay, so that's what we expect. This is what we do not expect. Disengagement. So getting up and walking out of meetings when the conversation gets uncomfortable, when we mention race or white supremacy, um, that's just, it's not acceptable. It feels, and I've been on the receiving end of that, I'll say, and it feels, it's such a um, it is such a, a minimizing of the experience for the child, but it's also sends a very clear statement about um, what you think of, of that parent, what you think of the situation and the fact that you just don't care. And I don't think any public school um, and the publicly funded school uh, in this province um, can, can afford that kind of disengagement. So use of racial slurs, racial tropes or stereotypes directed at parents or advocates during meetings, um, being mindful of, of your, how you approach the meeting, right? So um, are you, we've had individuals on calls who have used racial slurs on the call, who are intentionally repeating racial slurs um, that we were there to discuss. That's harmful. It puts our advocates uh, in a situation where they're experiencing racial violence now. Now they have to navigate the fact that they're there to support a parent where the child might've been called the N-word, um, but now they've been assaulted with that word, right? So it's that's harmful <laughs> and it's, it should not be accepted. And if we're in situations where um, that happens, it shouldn't, it also shouldn't be left to the advocate to now have to explain why that's a problem, demand that that person is removed and look for, for justice for themselves as well in that situation, right? That there, especially if there are multiple, multiple people on the call, you should be also um, ensuring that you move into that, that stage of urgency to deal with that matter, right? Um, refusing to meet with parents and advocates or delaying or roadblocking meetings. And what we mean by roadblocking is things like saying, you know, my policy says you can only have one advocate with you. When we go to school board meetings, oftentimes there are multiple people representing the school board. There's superintendent of, you know, everything, um, three or four people. It's the same thing with advocacy supports. We work with other organizations. We do, we consult at PLBC. Our advocates usually work together. Um, so you'll have two advocates, two or three, depending on the case, um, working together to provide support in the same way that all of you as members of the school board work collaboratively with each other on, on different issues. So, you know, saying to a parent, you can only bring one person to us, that is a roadblock, um, as well as saying, you know, the meeting must take place in person. When we think about um, accessibility and the fact that 
before COVID, you know, things were done a certain way and COVID has really allowed schools the opportunity to be more accessible to parents, many of whom are working, some are working multiple jobs, an online meeting may be easier. Um, and so having that and making that happen, um, there needs to be some thought around that approach as well, because saying to a parent, you must have an, a, a meeting in person um, is, is highly problematic, especially if they're working with an advocate. Uh, tone policing. So tone policing advocates are parents during meetings. So we're talking about uh, children. We're talking about harm directed at children. And so, and like I said, it's not comfortable conversation and it will be emotional. And so the tone policing, I think, is not, it's something we do not expect, particularly for parents who may have a hard time you know, expressing themselves exactly how they want to express it, who are trying to deal with a hundred things at once and a hundred, you know, different feelings and emotions. Um, but what we don't expect is that um, that tone policing or that, you know, um, putting that up as an excuse, uh, as a reason not to continue a meeting. Um, there's really no, no, no reason for that kind of um, approach. And then the last is delayed action. So like I said, we approach everything with urgency because we know it's urgent and we're expecting that for families as well. We're expecting quick and swift movement, quick and swift resolution. Um, and we don't want what, you know, what we don't want is situations where policy is quoted or school boards um, legal or investigative process is quoted as a reason why there can't be resolution. We know that there are always um, ways in which to provide support um, that that work around those policies and those procedures. And if those policies and procedures are roadblocks, then you need to identify that and look at how um, how you rebuild, right? How you rebuild those policies. Okay, so what can school boards expect from us? And so in addition to the urgency, the consent, the transparency and the accountability that we mentioned, school boards can expect, like I said, an email notifying them, um, all leaders of the issue, a collaborative approach to resolving concerns, a timely response to email communication, um, and they can expect us to be present with parents and to vigorously support parents who have come in for support. Next slide. So this is just, you know, if we were to encapsulate and leave you with one thing around our, the way in which we, we approach advocacy, it's really that we anchor our advocacy support in the Ontario Human Rights Commission policy and guidelines on racism and racial discrimination. And you can look, you can find this online, excuse me, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> part two of that policy states that a citizen who honestly and reasonably believes that he or she is being treated unjustly is entitled to protest vigorously as long as there is no resort to threatening gestures to accompany the words. So that's always our approach. We, we will always vigorously support our families um, and any family that has been disenfranchised by the system. Um, so I'll leave you with that. I think that's our last slide. Can we move to the next one? Yes. So that's our last slide. I want to, we'll open it up for, for questions. And um, the idea is, you know, we'll, we'll pause the recording. Can we pause the recording? We'll take questions. And then um, once there are no other questions. Okay. Okay. So thank you for joining us. So I see Emil. Okay. Okay. Um, so Emil, <laughs> you're the lone, the last person. So we have Adlin. Adlin is going to be our interpreter. Um, so Adlin, I guess what I was thinking is I we could just speak and then you can offer the interpretation. If I may, uh, Kiri, I understand very well in English. I um, I'm from AFO, which is a francophone teachers union, and I was really looking forward to hearing reactions from the school boards and and different people that were here. So uh, I I, I want to save you the trouble, and uh, I mean I I really appreciated your presentation, and I'll be taking some of this back to our leadership, and um, uh, but I don't want to uh, make Adeline work for. Uh, <laughs> uh, if there's no need. 
Thank you. I appreciate that. And we are on our website right now. The French video, I believe, is there. Um, but we're we will be uploading the and you can use the translate the translation tool to get the French framework, but the actual document will be uploaded this afternoon. And if it would be help, helpful if you want us to present to your team in French, that might be. Uh, I've actually got a lot of takeaways noted in here, and I know some of my colleagues from the other affiliates have been in touch with uh, uh, your parents of Black children, and um, I, I honestly was very, uh, uh, very happy to see that all the work you put in the French uh, materials and, and just this opportunity to have Adeline, um, you know, interpret, and I mean, I really appreciate and I... Uh, there's um, uh, there are many challenges when it comes to the francophone community, and uh, when we're talking about intersectionalities, um, uh, there are a lot less resources when it comes to, to the francophone systems. So I really, really appreciate this. And honestly, I, I've been doing a lot of research lately, and uh, I like how um, how clear your approach is. Um, I used to work for a school board, so I know that you know, there might be challenges with the reception of uh, advocates during meetings and stuff like that. But I, I agree with, with everything that's been said. Uh, I mean, uh, accountability and transparency are key items. And uh, uh, I've been involved in the Francophone community for a while and um, uh, there are challenges. And, and honestly, you gave me some ideas for other things that I'm working on. So uh, thank you very much. And I don't want to take any more of your time, but uh, uh, it's very appreciated. And I'll be in touch if uh, uh, if we need uh, uh, maybe a little um, uh, more precisions down the line. Absolutely. Yeah, we're we're here to support and, you know, we're working on our French resources. So please reach out. Yeah, please reach out. Yeah. But here's another piece. If they stop streaming our children out of French from kindergarten, maybe we'll have a little bit more. Right. <laughs> That's we true. <laughs> out from kindergarten and grade one. And that's that's a big part of our advocacy, the grade, the French immersion um, streaming. Yeah, so I'm, I'm with the French system. So, uh, I, but I have heard that um, with the, the Anglophone system, uh, they'll actually outstream Francophones from the immersion system because they're having too many challenges in English uh, in regions where there are no Francophone schools. So there are definitely challenges uh when it comes to that as well so thanks again and uh take care okay thank you thanks very much well, thank you Edlin. <laughs> thank you for joining um so it, we didn't need it but i'm glad that you were here and i'm glad that we were able to at least offer